There are a couple of gunshot wounds in the torso area and one through the head. He said he was leaving and he wasn't coming back. And I just, I just burst into tears. After all these years, how could somebody think that I did that? So you believe an innocent woman is behind bars right now? Absolutely. I believe this is a case of a wrongful conviction. It started with a suitcase, a dark, unassuming suitcase floating in the peaceful waters of the Chesapeake Bay. But when it was opened, what lay inside would ignite one of the most disturbing murder investigations the state had ever seen. Dismembered human legs wrapped in garbage bags. That was only the beginning. In the days that followed, more suitcases would wash ashore, each containing more body parts, piece by piece revealing the horrifying fate of Bill McGuire. But how did this seemingly ordinary suburban man end up in pieces, discarded like trash in suitcases? And why were the clues, each more bizarre than the last, pointing straight to his wife, Melanie McGuire, a well-respected fertility nurse who claimed to be nothing more than a victim herself. A tangled web of gambling, secrets, and an illicit affair soon began to surface, but the question remains, could a devoted mother really be capable of such a brutal crime? Was it an act of desperation, or was there something far more sinister at play? What would drive someone to not only take a life but to dismember it in such a calculated way. But before we dive deeper into the mystery, I'd like to ask for a small favor. The statistics show that more than 70% of you watching aren't subscribed to the channel yet. If you're enjoying these deep dives into true crime and want to stay updated on future cases, please consider subscribing. It really helps the channel grow and ensures you don't miss out on any new videos. Now, without further ado, let's get back to the case. Melanie McGuire was a successful fertility nurse living in New Jersey. She worked a job she loved, helping families achieve their dreams of parenthood. Her husband, Bill McGuire, was a computer programmer, a stable career that provided a comfortable life for the couple and their two young sons. They lived in a pristine home in Woodbridge Township, a place where the lawns were always neatly trimmed and life appeared picture perfect. To their neighbors, they were the quintessential middle-class family. To their friends, they were the McGuire's, the couple who seemed to have it all together. But as is often the case, appearances can be deceiving. Beneath the surface of their seemingly happy marriage, there were cracks, cracks that no one saw coming but would eventually tear the family apart in ways too gruesome to imagine. Bill, while charming and successful to the outside world, was far from the ideal husband Melanie had hoped for. According to her, he had a temper that was volatile and unpredictable. Over time, his mood swings became more frequent and his outbursts more severe. It wasn't just the typical stresses of life that were getting to Bill, he had developed a dangerous addiction, gambling. Bill's trips to Atlantic City, once infrequent getaways, soon became regular escapes. Hours would disappear at the casino tables, and Bill would often return home empty-handed, angrier than before, knowing he had gambled away more than just money. Melanie could sense the strain on their finances, but more than that, she began to fear for the future of their family. Would Bill's addiction spiral out of control, leaving them in financial ruin? Could she continue living in the shadow of a man who was, according to her, losing himself to his vices? Behind closed doors, the tension in their home was becoming unbearable. Arguments between the couple were no longer rare. They were frequent and explosive. Melanie started to fear not only for her own well-being, but also for her children's safety. With each trip Bill made to the casino, Melanie felt the grip of her seemingly perfect life loosening. But even as the walls closed in, there was one secret that Melanie had kept hidden from everyone, one that would soon become a central focus of the case against her. While Bill spent his time at the casino, Melanie found solace in the arms of another man, Dr. Bradley Miller, 
a respected colleague at the fertility clinic where she worked. Their affair began during a tumultuous time in Melanie's life, while she was pregnant with her second child. To some, this might have been a fleeting affair, born out of frustration. But for Melanie, the connection with Bradley was more than just a temporary escape. It was, perhaps, her only source of comfort and stability in a life that was spiraling out of control. The affair wasn't just emotional. It was a passionate escape from the increasing chaos in her home. In her mind, Dr. Miller was everything Bill wasn't. Calm, understanding, and a man who could give her a way out of the nightmare her marriage had become. Their relationship deepened as Bill's temper worsened, and by 2004, Melanie had started to consider leaving Bill for good. The thought of divorce crept into her mind. She consulted divorce attorneys, likely imagining a fresh start with Bradley Miller, free from Bill's toxic behavior and gambling addiction. But the path she would take to free herself from Bill would be anything but ordinary. What no one could foresee was that this simmering tension would soon explode into one of the most horrific and cold-blooded crimes the state of New Jersey had ever seen. Melanie wouldn't just leave Bill. She would be implicated in a crime so shocking, so brutal, that it would make national headlines and haunt the public for years to come. April 28, 2004, started like any other day in the McGuire household, except that by the end of it, Bill McGuire would vanish without a trace. According to Melanie McGuire, the couple had a violent argument that evening. Their fights, she claimed, had been escalating for months, but this one was different. In a rage, Bill packed his belongings into their Nissan Maxima and stormed out, vowing never to return. Melanie would later say that Bill threatened to leave her for good, a claim that she used to explain why she filed for a restraining order against him the next day. She cited domestic abuse and claimed to be concerned for her children's safety. But Bill McGuire didn't just disappear from the home. He disappeared from the face of the earth. Just days after Bill's disappearance, on May 5, 2004, a seemingly random group of fishermen were out on Chesapeake Bay in Virginia, a place known for its peaceful waters and idyllic views. But that day, the peaceful setting would be shattered. While casting their lines, they noticed something strange floating in the water, a dark green Kenneth Cole suitcase. At first, they thought it might contain something valuable, maybe even a hidden treasure. When they opened the suitcase, they were greeted by a grotesque sight. Dismembered human legs, wrapped tightly in garbage bags. The Chesapeake Bay was no longer just a peaceful spot. It was now the site of a crime scene that would baffle and horrify the nation. This was just the beginning of a nightmare that would soon unfold. As the days passed, the situation became more grim. Less than a week later, on May 11th, a second suitcase washed ashore. This time, it contained the torso and head of a man, along with two bullet wounds to the chest. Whoever had committed this crime had gone to extreme lengths to cover their tracks. Dismembering the body in a manner so brutal it sent chills down investigators' spines. Then, on May 16th, a third and final suitcase was discovered. This one contained the victim's arms, completing the macabre jigsaw puzzle of human remains. Chesapeake Bay had become the final resting place for a man whose identity was still unknown, but whose murder would soon capture headlines nationwide. With the body parts found, law enforcement was quick to launch a massive investigation. Given the discovery's proximity to Virginia, investigators initially looked into missing persons cases in the area, particularly focusing on military personnel given the nearby base. But as the clues came together, they realized this was no ordinary local crime. It was much larger. As the Virginia police worked tirelessly, they began to collaborate with law enforcement in New Jersey. The police released a composite sketch of the victim, and soon enough, a tip came in from one of Bill McGuire's friends. The sketch, disturbingly accurate, matched Bill. The puzzle pieces started falling into place. But who would go to such gruesome lengths to kill and dismember Bill McGuire? 
Once Bill's body was identified through dental records, suspicion quickly turned to his wife, Melanie McGuire. Their tumultuous relationship and Bill's sudden disappearance put her directly in the spotlight. Yet Melanie, calm and composed, stuck to her story. She maintained that Bill had left after their fight, claiming she had no knowledge of what had happened to him afterward. But investigators were skeptical. It didn't take long for them to find the first major clue that tied Melanie to the crime, a clue that would unravel her carefully crafted story. Just two days before Bill disappeared, Melanie had purchased a 38 caliber handgun from a Pennsylvania gun shop. The weapon? A Taurus revolver firing wad cutter bullets, the exact same type found lodged in Bill's body. According to Melanie, she had bought the gun at Bill's request because he felt unsafe and wanted protection. Yet, Bill's criminal record prevented him from buying a gun himself. And this story didn't sit well with investigators. But where was the gun now? Melanie couldn't say. It had simply disappeared, just like Bill. As investigators dug deeper, they uncovered even more troubling details. On April 30, 2004, just two days after Bill's disappearance, his car was found in the parking lot of the Flamingo Motel in Atlantic City. This might have seemed like an ordinary finding, given Bill's frequent trips to the casinos in the area. But what investigators unearthed next would push the case in a much darker direction. Security footage from the motel captured a shadowy figure moving Bill's car into the parking lot, but the footage was grainy and unclear. The person in the footage didn't appear to be Bill, and while investigators couldn't conclusively identify the person, they were sure it was not him. Then came the damning discovery of Melanie McGuire's Easy Pass records. On the same day Bill's car was found, Melanie's Easy Pass tag pinged as she drove on the Atlantic City Expressway. At first, Melanie claimed she had nothing to do with her husband's disappearance. But when confronted with this evidence, she told a bizarre story that she had moved Bill's car as a prank to confuse him. She alleged that she knew Bill had gone to Atlantic City due to his gambling habits, and out of spite, she drove down there, found his car, and relocated it as part of a twisted joke. But the story didn't end there. Not only had Melanie driven Bill's car to the Flamingo Motel, but investigators discovered that she had contacted Easy Pass customer service twice, frantically trying to have those toll charges removed from her account. The reason? She admitted in later interviews that she feared the charges would make her look suspicious. Her explanation was that she had panicked after realizing how the evidence might be interpreted. Her reasoning only deepened the investigator's doubts. If she had known that the toll records might be incriminating, why would she move the car in the first place, especially just days after a violent argument with Bill? To law enforcement, it all seemed more like an attempt to cover her tracks than any sort of prank. As investigators pieced together the puzzle, more forensic evidence began to emerge evidence that directly connected Melanie to the murder. During a search of the McGuire's home, police discovered garbage bags matching those used to wrap Bill's dismembered body. Not only that, but fibers found on Bill's remains matched the fabric of a green couch that had once sat in the couple's living room. The couch had mysteriously disappeared, but the forensic team found enough fibers to link the couch to the murder scene. Then, there was the matter of the suitcases themselves. The suitcases that had carried Bill's body parts into the Chesapeake Bay were traced back to a matching set that Melanie and Bill had owned. It was becoming clear that the items used to commit and cover up the crime came from their very own home. But the most incriminating piece of evidence was yet to come. In the midst of this mounting physical evidence, Investigators discovered an alarming digital trail left behind on the McGuire's home computer. Search histories revealed chilling inquiries like how to commit murder, how to purchase guns illegally, and undetectable poisons. These searches painted a disturbing picture of premeditation, suggesting that Melanie had been planning Bill's murder for some time. As the mountain of evidence grew larger, authorities knew it was time to act. 
over a year after Bill McGuire's brutal murder on June 2, 2005, police made their move. Melanie McGuire was at her new home in Brick Township, New Jersey, a seemingly quiet morning as she prepared to drop off her children at daycare. But the peace of that day would be shattered. As she stepped outside, she was met by law enforcement officers who were waiting, hidden in the bushes, ready to take her into custody. They had everything they needed. With no incident, Melanie was handcuffed and arrested, charged with first-degree murder. The news of Melanie's arrest sent shockwaves through her friends, family, and colleagues. How could this gentle, soft-spoken nurse, the mother who appeared so devoted to her children, possibly be involved in such a horrifying and violent crime? To those who knew her, the idea seemed impossible, but the authorities were convinced they had their killer. Melanie's life had been a masterclass in appearances, but now, the veneer of normalcy was cracking. Even as friends rushed to her defense, there was something undeniably chilling about how the pieces of the puzzle were falling together. After her arrest, Melanie was released on bail, temporarily free while awaiting trial. But the prosecution was just getting started. Over the next year, the case against her intensified. On October 26, 2006, new charges were brought against her, this time for hindering apprehension. Prosecutors claimed that Melanie had been writing anonymous letters to the police, desperate attempts to throw them off her trail. These letters were a feeble attempt to manipulate the investigation, but instead of leading the authorities astray, they only served to tighten the noose around her. The more Melanie tried to hide, the more it became clear that she had something to hide. Throughout her interrogation and legal proceedings, Melanie McGuire stuck to her story. She maintained her innocence, adamantly claiming that Bill had left after their argument and that she had nothing to do with his death. But as the investigation progressed, her story began to unravel in the face of damning evidence. Under pressure, Melanie admitted to moving Bill's car to Atlantic City, but once again, she stuck with the same strange explanation. It was a prank, she said, a childish attempt to frustrate Bill, and her explanation for trying to erase the easy pass toll charges? She panicked. Fearing that the charges would make her look guilty, she had tried to cover her tracks. But each attempt to explain away her actions only made the situation worse. Every word seemed to bury her deeper in suspicion. But the final blow came with the discovery of phone recordings, conversations between Melanie and her lover, Dr. Bradley Miller. The police had been monitoring these calls, hoping to catch Melanie in a confession, or at least see her true emotions about Bill's death. What they uncovered was even more damning. Not only did the recordings show a disturbing lack of emotion regarding her husband's brutal murder, but Melanie was also caught joking about the situation. For someone whose spouse had been violently killed and dismembered, Melanie's light-hearted attitude was chilling. These calls further cemented the theory that she had been involved in the crime, acting not out of desperation or fear, but with cold, calculated intent. With the phone recordings, forensic evidence, and witness testimonies piling up, prosecutors were ready to make their case. Melanie McGuire was formally indicted, and the trial was set to begin. What started as a tragic disappearance had now become a chilling murder case that would grip the nation. Melanie McGuire's trial began on March 5, 2007, at the Middlesex County Courthouse in New Brunswick, New Jersey. The prosecution's case was largely based on circumstantial evidence, but it painted a damning picture of a woman who meticulously planned and carried out the murder of her husband in order to start a new life with her lover. They argued that Melanie had drugged Bill, shot him, dismembered his body, and disposed of the remains in suitcases. One of the key elements of the prosecution's argument was the gun that Melanie had purchased just two days before Bill's disappearance. The 38 caliber Taurus revolver, along with wad cutter bullets, matched the type of bullet found in Bill's torso. The prosecution argued that this weapon was used to kill Bill, even though the gun itself was never recovered. The suitcases in which Bill's remains were found were another crucial piece of evidence. 
the prosecution presented testimony from friends and family, as well as forensic evidence, that linked the suitcases to a matching set owned by the McGuire's. Additionally, the fibers from the green couch in the McGuire home that matched those found on the bullets in Bill's body further implicated Melanie. The black garbage bags used to wrap Bill's remains were also tied to the McGuire's home. The prosecution also presented damning testimony about Melanie's efforts to conceal her involvement. The easy pass records showing her trip to Atlantic City, her attempts to remove the toll charges, and her evasive behavior were all used to suggest that she had been trying to cover her tracks. Furthermore, her affair with Dr. Bradley Miller was presented as the primary motive for the murder, with the prosecution arguing that Melanie had killed Bill to begin a new life with her lover. In her defense, Melanie maintained her innocence. She testified that Bill had been abusive and that she feared for her safety. She claimed that her husband's gambling addiction had put their family in financial jeopardy and that he may have been killed by someone he owed money to. She denied any involvement in his murder and insisted that the evidence against her was either coincidental or circumstantial. Despite her defense, the jury was swayed by the sheer amount of evidence linking her to the crime. After deliberating for several days, they found Melanie guilty of first-degree murder, as well as additional charges of perjury, desecration of human remains, and illegal possession of a firearm. However, she was acquitted of hindering apprehension and tampering with evidence. On April 23, 2007, the jury reached its decision. Melanie McGuire was found guilty of first-degree murder as well as the related charges of perjury, desecration of human remains, and unlawful possession of a weapon. The prosecution's case had successfully convinced the jury that despite the lack of direct physical evidence, the overwhelming circumstantial evidence and her suspicious behavior were enough to prove her guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. Melanie was sentenced to life in prison on July 19, 2007, at the age of 34. In addition to the life sentence, she was given additional time for the related charges. Under New Jersey law, Melanie would not be eligible for parole for at least 63 years, meaning she would likely spend the rest of her life behind bars. Following her conviction, Melanie McGuire's case continued to captivate the public's attention. The media dubbed her the suitcase killer, and her story was featured in various true crime documentaries podcasts, and television shows. The bizarre nature of the crime, combined with the salacious details of her affair, made the case a subject of fascination for true crime enthusiasts. In 2022, Lifetime even produced a movie titled Suitcase Killer, The Melanie McGuire Story, dramatizing the events leading up to Bill McGuire's murder and Melanie's eventual conviction. Throughout the years, Melanie has steadfastly maintained her innocence, insisting that she was framed or that Bill was murdered by someone else due to his gambling debts. In September 2020, she gave her first interview in over a decade on ABC's 2020, where she reiterated her claims. During the interview, she expressed disbelief that people could think she committed such a brutal crime and continued to argue that her husband was likely killed by people to whom he owed money. Melanie has filed multiple appeals since her conviction, the first of which was in 2011. Her legal team argued that the trial had been flawed due to errors made by her defense attorneys and that the circumstantial evidence presented at trial was insufficient for a conviction. Despite these arguments, the New Jersey Appellate Court upheld the conviction. In 2014, Melanie filed for post-conviction relief claiming ineffective assistance of counsel and newly discovered evidence. However, this too was denied. Criminologists and legal experts have also weighed in on the case. Some, like Professors Megan Sachs and Amy Schlossberg of Fairleigh Dickinson University, have questioned the strength of the prosecution's case. They argued that there were gaps in the narrative and that the circumstantial evidence, while compelling, did not conclusively prove that Melanie was the killer. Their podcast, Direct Appeal, 
focused on examining Melanie's conviction and raised questions about whether justice had truly been served in her case. Today, Melanie remains incarcerated at the Edna Mahan Correctional Facility for Women, where she is serving out her life sentence. With no chance of parole until the age of 101, and with every legal appeal thus far being denied, it's likely she will spend the rest of her life behind bars. But the questions surrounding her case still linger. Was Melanie truly the mastermind behind her husband's brutal murder? Or was she a victim of circumstance, framed and left to bear the weight of someone else's crime? Could Bill's gambling debts have led to his death by another's hand, as Melanie claims? Or was this a cold, calculated plan to escape an unhappy marriage and start fresh with her lover? We'd love to hear your thoughts. Do you believe the evidence was enough to convict Melanie? Or are there still too many unanswered questions? Let us know what you think in the comments below. And if you enjoyed this deep dive into one of New Jersey's most infamous cases, don't forget to hit that subscribe button. Your support helps us bring more of these riveting cases to light, and every subscription gets us one step closer to uncovering the next chilling mystery.